next meeting of the school board of the city of Virginia Beach is now in session. This is our formal meeting format. At this time, I ask that everyone in attendance please silence their electronic devices and phones. And I ask my colleagues to acknowledge their presence on the voting board. And uh, I made an announcement earlier, Ms. Mrs. McLeod is not with us this evening due to a work obligation to, that requires her to be out of town. At this time, I'm asking everyone to join me in a moment of silence. Please rise as you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We will now proceed with our awards and recognitions. Mr. Edwards. Uh, no, sorry, it's Miss Manning. It was her. For our first recognition, please join me in welcoming the nation's 2018 Coast Guard Military Child of the Year, Rourke Corson, senior at Ocean Lakes High School. Rourke and six other honorees from across the nation whose families represent each branch, branch of the military were recognized in Washington, D.C. last week for excelling in academics, volunteerism, and overcoming challenges that face military children. Rourke, whose family has moved eight times, has maintained a 4.5 grade point average and was named a U.S. Presidential Scholar semifinalist, a distinction honoring America's top 630 high school graduating seniors based on exceptional scores on the ACT and SAT. Additionally, he is an avid volunteer with the National Alliance on Mental Illness and I Need a Lighthouse organization, where he not only shares his time, but raises funds and serves as a speaker and advocate. Rourke is extremely proud of his military family. His father, Caleb, just retired after serving 30 plus years with the Coast Guard. On behalf of all of us here, thank you, Mr. Corson, for your service. And congratulations to Rourke on being named the 2018 Coast Guard Military Child of the Year. Next, this, next, the school division would like to recognize students selected to the state's prestigious music ensembles. To be selected means that students have distinguished themselves as top performers in their strand from amongst their music peers across the Commonwealth. Let's meet them. Students named to the 2018 All Virginia Middle School Chorus are from Corporate Landing Middle School, Ashton Dodrell. <laughs> Abigail Deer. <laughs> Isabel Polanco. <laughs> Destiny Lopez. Ilraya Nicholas. <laughs> Isabella Gayton. <laughs> Renata De Gaia. And from Lansdowne Middle School, Giovanna Ramos. Congratulations to our 2018 All Virginia Middle School Chorus honorees. Next. <laughs> next in the spring following. Thank you. Next, in the spring, the following students were named to All Virginia Course 2018. From First Colonial High School, Jasmine Johnston. From Green Run High School, Kayara Ellison. William Mahoney. Xavier Smith. And from Kempsville High School, Paige Bryant. And <clears throat> And from Princess Anne High School, Shreya 
Naga Haria Hariava. <laughs> And from Salem's Visual and Performing Arts Academy, Don Tye, Rodas, Chris Cowan, Shina McCoy, Kirsten McDonald, Taylor McPherson, and from Tallwood High School, Chris Goodall, Marissa Goodall, Congratulations to all Virginia Chorus 2018. Additionally, earlier this year, the following students were named to the All Virginia Senior Honors Choir from Tallwood High School, Marissa Goodall, and from Salem High School's Visual and Performing Arts Academy, Chris Cowan, China McCoy, and Audrey Reyes. Congratulations to our All Virginia Senior Honors Choir. Next, these two trumpeteers can certainly play and thus were named to the All Virginia Jazz Band 2018 from Princess Anne High School, Justin Thornton, and from Tallwood High School, Joshua Villa. And our next group of honorees were named to All Virginia Band and Orchestra 2018. From Cox High School, Gabriel Henkin and Micah Latrell. From Kellum High School, Alexandri Alexander Antonio. From Ocean Lakes High School, Ethan Boardman and Jordan Sconing. From Princess Anne High School, Eva Johnson and Justin Thornton. Salem High School, Micah Ayala. And from Tallwood High School, Christopher Montoya and Joshua Villa. Congratulations to all Virginia Band and Orchestra honorees. And one more round for all of our Virginia's premier music students. Yes. Our last recognition is for our school music departments that received blue ribbon or honor band distinctions. <laughs> Accepting the awards on behalf of their schools are the group's music directors. First, these five schools received the highest recognition awarded to a high school band in the Commonwealth. Let's meet the 2017-18 honor bands. From Cox High School, Mike Lane. From, from Kellum High School, Cameron Baker. Ocean Lakes High School, Michael Parker. Tallwood High School, Tim Rossettini. And Princess Anne High School, John Boyd. And this, this is the 20th year that Princess Anne High School has received this honor. In addition, eight schools were named Blue Ribbon Schools. This distinction can only be achieved if a school's band, orchestra, and chorus all receive superior ratings at their respective district assessments. The schools are Corporate Landing Middle School, James Reed, Band Director, Leanne Stavon, Orchestra Director, and Mary Letson, Choral Director. <laughs> Great Neck Middle School, Heather Smith, Band Director. Robin Sawyer, Orchestra Director. And Lou Ann Mead, Choral Director. 
Thamesville Middle School. Unfortunately, they were not able to join us this evening, but congratulations. Old Donation School, Kenneth Poe, band director. <laughs> Delina Poe, choral director. <laughs> Plaza Middle School, Louis Terabic, band director. <laughs> Sarah McGee, orchestra director. <laughs> and Aaron DeBose, choral director. Salem Middle School, Joe Marie Larkin, band director. <laughs> Laura Parker, orchestra director. <laughs> and Erica Wilkins, choral director. <laughs> Cox High School, Mike Lane, band director. <laughs> Emily Waters, orchestra director and Cindy Forbes, choral director. Ocean Lakes High School, Michael Parker, band director. <laughs> Carrie Sitzler, orchestra director. And Bill Boardman, choral director. While our music directors are up on stage, we also want to announce some news that is hot off the press. Virginia Beach City Public Schools has again been named a best community for music education. is awarded to school divisions that demonstrate exceptionally high commitment to access to music and access to music education. Congratulations to all of this evening's honorees. <laughs> Madam Chairwoman, this concludes our recognition for this evening. Dr. Spence, we look forward to hearing the superintendent's report. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and members of the board. You know, as many of you know, April is Volunteer Appreciation Month, and we are so incredibly fortunate here in Virginia Beach Schools to have an incredible volunteer base that shares their time and their insight with our students. As, uh, as we announced recently, last year in just one school year, we had 23,000 volunteers and partners contribute over 334,000 hours of service to Virginia Beach Public Schools. According to the Independent Sector Organization's estimated value of volunteer time, that actually would equate to about $8 million uh, in our budget if we were to have to pay for that. So that's incredible. And last week, the Office of Community Engagement held the annual community celebration for our volunteers of the year, as well as our model partners. Whether they're organizing library books and reading with our students or creating outdoor learning labs and hosting Shark Tank competitions for our schools, it's hard to encompass all of the ways that our division has been impacted by these incredible volunteers and model partners. So for tonight's Compass Keepers, we're going to learn more about the nine local businesses and organizations that led the way in this work and have been named 2018 Model Partners. <coughs> Uh, the kids have been working for several weeks on some prototypes of toys that are actually going to be sent um, on our medical missions to give to our patients to bring them comfort and joy uh, before and after surgery. We were given the assignment to create a toy for the smile bags in Operation Smile 
and we decided to create a car, but we wanted to make it unique in our own way. We decided to add a mirror to the front of the, the bottom of the car so they could see their smiles after their surgery. And so what we're doing is looking at them meeting with um, a representative from Ford who's going to actually come in and they're going to pitch the idea to him next week and hopefully uh, hoping that he'll be able to fund their product. They can sit there and roll this on the ground and look at their new smile and how their lives have changed so drastically. It just makes us feel that we've really accomplished something. The main program that I run is called Schools Restoring Oysters to the Chesapeake. For the students, the, one of the exciting parts of the partnership is that they get to be exposed to oysters and they get to be a part of a really large scale oyster restoration effort and that's exciting for the students to feel like they have the ability to make a difference in the environment. Okay, we have a really fun partnership with Lincoln Park Elementary School. We have a student-run credit union there. I'm a teller and when people come up with their money and they usually come with an account number and on the deposit slip and the receipt we put the account number and then we put their name, the date, how much money they have or check. So that they have a lot of um, multitasking going on and a lot of responsibility. We do a lot of math for accounting the money. It's not just like opening up the textbook and doing some work. It's more like actually having it in your hand and doing it. We're learning about saving money and how it's important to have money always and not to just spend it. And once they get that mindset, and the earlier, the younger kids, then they get that mindset, it empowers them. It doesn't matter if they're a millionaire or they just have a penny in their pocket. They're going to carry that along with them. I partnered with uh, Lambstown Elementary, the gifted resources teacher over there named Kim Cabotaje. The project was to design and construct uh, a learning lab, so a greenhouse uh, and a shed and a garden um, that was designed and constructed by the kids. It, they obviously get an enriched curriculum uh, and uh, you know an expansion of the sort of um, uh, you know, learning experience, right, by way of the structures themselves, but also the curriculum that's tied into them. So the partnership with uh, Virginia Star is uh, kind of a multifaceted partnership. Um, it's got a lot of different benefits. Uh, one of the first ones being that we are keeping computers and uh, electronic devices out of the landfill. We're actually refurbishing them, repurposing them. Um, if we cannot refurbish them, uh, they actually are recycled down in uh, my classroom. Not only though are we recycling, but we're providing working computers to uh, families and students in need in the community as well as community centers. And we also are providing uh, real world hands-on skills to uh, the students that are participating in this partnership. So they are working, uh, getting actual 21st century technology skills while working towards industry cert level certifications. We have partnered up with all kinds of students and clubs from Old Nation School. They've come out. Um, I've also brought students out here to this school. And our focus is promote sustainability and to understand um, environmental education. Our kids are developing much more confidence in themselves. They're developing much more confidence in their understanding of the environment. And they're really building relationship with people. And for the kids at Old Nation, I think it's important because they are kids from all over the city. So when they come to our gardens, we tell them this is our garden now. And they actually come in the summer and work with our kids side by side. And it is an amazing, beautiful thing. So Tara actually allows us to come into the clinical space, which is wonderful for the students. So it bridges the gap between what they're learning in the classroom, what they're learning in the skills lab, and then bringing that into that clinical experience. We get a lot more hands-on practice that we can use at the end of the year when we go to clinicals, which is where we actually go to a facility and practice all the skills that we've been learning. Sentara does such a wonderful opportunity by providing not just the clinical time, but allowing their staff to teach us too. So we've had training from diabetic instructors. We've had training from the wound care specialist, from the IV therapy team. They've opened the doors for us to, the students have actually seen operations. Our students have gone from an LPN, 
gone back to college, gotten their BS in, uh, recently found out that one of our students got, their, got her doctorate and she's now um, a nurse practitioner as well. The partnership between this school, my school, and Cook Elementary is mentors who are high school students come as many times a month as they can and they spend about an hour with the students here at Cook Elementary and they do their homework with them and they play games with them. They get a friend to talk to. It's like a big sister, big brother program and I get happiness from just sitting with other children and just hearing their everyday life because when I see one of the little girls smile, it just makes me so happy. The partnership between Tallwood High School and Tallwood Elementary School started in the spring of 2015 with one of the Academy students' senior projects. Some, uh, there's one on music, the history of African American music in the United States. Everything from spirituals to jazz to dance and how that all plays together. In 2017, we started a Be A Reader program with Tallwood Elementary where students from Tallwood come over and mentor Tallwood Elementary school students in reading. We help them along if they can't figure out a word and we talk about the book after. Each time we're coming to read with them, they're starting to like start less using their fingers to point out the words. I think it's important that the younger students see there's more to the world than what we see around us that they start to get exposed and become global citizens. That's part of the Compass to 2020. Really important that they start learning that younger. So again, I, I can't underscore enough how much we value and appreciate all the men and women who could be doing so many other things during their day, but choose to come and spend that time with us in our schools helping their children. And I hope like, that young lady that you saw in the video that they find a certain happiness in having that opportunity. Thank you all again to all of our partners and all of our volunteers for another incredible year. And that, Madam Chairwoman, completes my report. Thank you, Dr. Spence. Madam Clerk, do we have any speakers on agenda items this evening? Yes, ma'am, we have three. First, we have Michael Cohen, then Sharon DePeralta, then Ray Chang. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Michael Cohen. Uh, no relation to uh, Donald Trump's attorney, by the way. I just, oh. just wanted to clear the air on that first. Yeah, to steer the questions in the right direction. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to come and speak to you uh, concerning the issue of class rank, which uh, uh, I happen to, to find very important. Uh, just uh, by, by way of introduction, uh, I'm the government contracts manager at Bauer Compressors in Norfolk. I'm also an adjunct professor at TCC and ODU, and I have also taught at Hampton University, George Washington University, and Thomas Nelson Community College. And uh, I won't go through the list of courses because that's, that'll take up all my time, and I really don't want to do that. Uh, however, most relevant to uh, tonight's topic, I spent five years as a blue and gold officer, also known as a Naval Academy information officer, and we are the folks, for those of you who don't know, who interview and evaluate candidates for the Naval Academy. And uh, that is another reason why I have a, a strong interest in the class rank issue. Now, I know that I'm preaching to the choir, but anything that you folks do, anything that we do as citizens should be in the best interest of our students. And st our students need every advantage when they leave our high school system and go on into the real world. Okay? And anything that we do, any time that we alter a policy or create a policy, we should be weighing benefits versus disadvantages. And we should ask ourselves, will we be better off under the new system than we were under the old system? Not just, gee, we don't like the old system and maybe we ought to get rid of it, but are we really going to be better off with the new system? And will the improvement be enough to offset the disruption that we caused by getting rid of the old system? Okay, now, keep in mind that 
competition is a part of life. Again, I'm preaching to the choir on that one. Every one of you got your position on the school board in a competitive atmosphere. Uh, almost every one of your jobs, I'm sure, was awarded in a competitive means. And our students, wherever they go, are always going to be judged under competition. Now, with that said, I've heard some of the rationales for proposing to uh, dispense with class rank and replace it possibly by the Latin system and, and that sort of thing. And one of the rationales I've heard is, well, you know, the colleges really don't care about rank anyway. Well, let me set the record straight on that. If we really do some homework on this, we'll find that the top colleges in this country do. And I don't know how many of the, say, mid-level colleges or even if there are any mediocre colleges do. But I do know that the top colleges do, uh, including Caltech, MIT, Stanford, okay, and UVA, by the way, okay. And I do know that the service academies uh, uh, place a high value on what the class ranks are of their students. Some of the colleges I've named, and there are, there are too many of those to mention, uh, in fact, use as an advertisement or marketing tool the fact that uh, something like 90, pardon me? Okay, that, that, uh, that a certain percentage, not like over 90% of their students stood in the top 10% uh, of the class. Second, the, the rationale I've heard is that it's putting too much stress on the students. Well, we all have to learn to deal with stress. If we can't, we're gonna have a very serious problem getting through life. So we're, we're going to have to find a way to deal with that. Now, if there are things we don't like about the present system, I would urge you not to dispense with it, but there are ways to fix the problem. So let's work on fixing the problems. Let's make sure our students have every advantage. Thank you very much. Sharon Deperalta, then Ray Chang. Good evening. I know y'all just heard everything or a lot about the, the ranking. I also am here to speak about that. Um, I'm here to share my opinion on the talk going around um, about Virginia Beach High Schools. For some reason, there's talk going around amongst parents and students that the principals are deciding to not acknowledge their honor graduates and discussion going on around about um, doing away with the um, class rankings as well um, or the valedictorian. There are some things that are time-honored traditions and should not be changed. These are two of those, I feel. Graduation just won't be the same without them. Why is there even talk of doing away with these? Has this been researched? What is the just justification? Have we asked the Virginia Beach students their thoughts on it? Have we been, have they been surveyed? And they, I mean the students. Um, shouldn't the students and the parents of these students who are graduating have a say in the matter? I'm coming as a parent as well as an employee. Are we assuming that by honoring those that have achieved high marks in school are somehow belittling the achievements of the others who still graduated even if they didn't obtain with honors? I have more faith in our students in this city than that. I believe our students are proud of their peers who achieve honors or valedictorian and cheer support their achievements and are inspired by them. I believe they want to celebrate each other and each other's achievements, even if they didn't achieve it themselves. As far as those students who did achieve honors, I feel it is disrespectful to take away the recognition from them. They have worked hard and are deserving of recognition and praise in the same way those who simply graduate are celebrating their achievements. Right now, as it stands, I was told that each principal is, deci is the deciding factor if the honor grads would be acknowledged. Um, I feel that this is, is not the way it should be. I feel all schools should follow the same rule and we need to um, continue to have our students achieving academic excellence and receive the recognition they deserve. Because um, I feel by taking this recognition away from them, we're te teaching our children, just do what you need to do to get by, honey. Nobody really cares if you tried your best and you gave it your all. Nobody really cares in the end, you all get the same piece of paper. I feel that our children need to know we value them going above and beyond. 
and that they deserve that recognition for wanting to achieve that and not just show up at school, kind of chill, and then, yeah, eventually I'll do what I have to. I'm, I'll pull that D. I'll pull that C minus. And I feel that that's kind of the message we're giving our kids by trying to take the class rankings and the honoring of the honor grads. Thank you. Ray Chang. The English poet and essayist, Dr. Samuel Johnson, who has been described as the most distinguished man of letters in history, once said, praise like gold and diamonds owe its value, owes its value only to its scarcity. And this is true in particular when that praise comes in the form of an honors diploma. That honor is inversely proportional to the number who receive it, and thus to award the top 55% of a graduating class with honors, as is currently proposed, is to dilute that praise beyond any meaning. Indeed, when even the median student is an honors student, the honors designation becomes little more than a participation trophy. Participation trophies send a dangerous message, warned Betty Burdan in the New York Times, October 6, 2016. In real life, there are winners and losers. Trophies, she opined, should be given out for first, second, and third place. Participation should be recognized with a pat on the back. Similarly, the standard for honors should be set high. It will then carry more weight and merit greater acclaim, and be more meaningful to the universities and employers. A survey of the standards adopted by universities will show that more typical criteria are top 25% for cum laude, top 10% for magna cum laude, and top 3% for summa cum laude. I encourage the board to revise the proposal accordingly. Okay. Madam Chair, those are all the speakers I have signed up for the hearing on agenda items. <clears throat> Thank you. The chair will now entertain a motion to approve our minutes from the April 10th meeting. Mrs. Manning has made the motion, seconded by Mrs. Melnick. Voting board is open. <clears throat> Moving on to the adoption of the agenda. We need to amend the agenda this evening by removing bylaw 128 and postponing action on it until our next meeting on May 8th. We also need to add a resolution for voter registration of high school seniors. The chair will entertain a motion to adopt the agenda as amended by removing bylaw 128 and postponing action on it until May 8th and adding the resolution for students. Oh, it's already on there. Okay. So we only need to uh, remove bylaw 128. Okay. So the chair will um, uh, entertain a motion to. Um, Approve the agenda, adopt the agenda as amended. Mrs. Riggs has made the motion, seconded by Mr. Edwards. Did you want to change to the truck? Yes, we do need to do that as well. <laughs> one more one more change, because due to the um, elect electric going off, we were not able to do the um, second workshop um, this afternoon. And so that will be postponed until a later date. So that also is part of... Um, um, the agenda, ad, amend, amendment of the agenda. So um, the chair will entertain, did, I, did we get an, a motion? Mrs. Riggs has made the motion. Mr. Edwards, Mr. Edwards has seconded to, um, to approve the, the agenda as amended. Okay, voting board is open. <clears throat> The consent agenda has four resolutions this evening. The first resolution is for Teacher Appreciation Week. The chair recognizes Mrs. Riggs for the first resolution. Teacher Appreciation Week resolution, May 6th through 12th, 2018. Whereas research, 
Research shows that classroom teachers have significant impact on student achievement and success and whereas teachers' efforts in planning, teaching and assessing directly impact student growth and whereas teachers work in collaboration with school administrators to engage families and the community to create challenging, authentic learning opportunities for children and whereas the school board appreciates the hard work and time teachers dedicate to support student achievement both in and outside of the classroom and whereas this dedication contributes to a strong positive school culture and whereas the school division has partnered with our parents and community members to express our appreciation for teachers through the we are VB schools great dreams need great teachers campaign and whereas the school division uses this campaign campaign to highlight the work of our extraordinary instructional staff throughout the entire school year, but especially during Teacher Appreciation Week. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach officially recognizes May 6th through 12th, 2018 as Teacher Appreciation Week, and be it further resolved that the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach encourages all community members to support and participate in activities designed to recognize teachers for their tireless work as educational leaders and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be distributed to each school in the division to be posted in a prominent location. Thank you, Mrs. Riggs. <clears throat> the next resolution is for School Nurse Appreciation Day. The chair recognizes Mrs. Felton. School Nurse Appreciation Resolution, whereas school nurses are individuals in the forefront who work with families, teachers, and administrators to ensure students of Virginia Beach City Public Schools have the safest and healthiest possible environment in which to learn and whereas good health is essential to the learning process and students' achievement, and whereas the goal of every professional school nurse is to help each student reach or maintain an optimum level of wellness, and whereas school nurses provide direct nursing care, <laughs> provide health screenings and follow-ups, provide health-related problems programs with the school system, provide health counseling, and act as resources to teachers on health education issues. And whereas school nurses serve the children of Virginia schools with dedication, working diligently to make health a priority for children during their regular school day. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach designate May 9th 2018 as School Nurse Appreciation Day in Virginia Beach and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board. Thank you, Mrs. Felton. Our next resolution is for the Virginia High School Student Registration Week. The chair recognizes Mrs. Holtz. Resolution re recognizing April 22nd to April 28th. Uh, 2018 as Virginia High School Student Registra Voter Registration Week, whereas the mission of the Virginia Beach City Public Schools in partnership with the entire community is to empower every student to become a lifelong learner who is responsible, productive, and an engaged citizen within the global community. <clears throat> and whereas the right to vote is an important civil liberty in the core of the American political system, and whereas voter registration for high school students who are 18 or who will turn 18 before an election should be accessible and convenient. And whereas educators play a critical role <clears throat> in the development of the students as productive, active citizens and participation in the electoral process is one of the earliest introductions that students can have to become informed and engaged citizens. And whereas Virginia secretaries of administration and education have worked with the Department of Elections and the Department of Education as well as 
other interested parties to conduct voter registration outreach to high schools across the Commonwealth. <clears throat> and whereas Governor Northam's proclamation recognizes April 22nd through April 28th, 2018, as the third annual Virginia High School Student Registration Week, in which teachers and students are encouraged to hold registration drives at their schools to make voter registration accessible and convenient for eligible high school students throughout the Commonwealth. <clears throat> and whereas Virginians can apply to register to vote by submitting paper applications by mail to the local general registrar in person at the local registrar's office at the Department of Motor Vehicles, completing the online form on the Department of Elections website or at a voter registration drive. And whereas voting is a vital part of our democracy and ensures that everyone's voice is heard, now therefore be it resolved <clears throat> that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach joins the governor in recognizing April 22nd through April 28th, 2018 as Virginia High School Student Voter Registration Week and encourages teachers and students to hold registration drives at their schools so that high school students who are qualified to register will have a convenient opportunity to do so and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board. Thank you, Mrs. Holtz. The next part of the consent agenda is for the technical and career education Carl Perkins school year 19 grant. As we uh, learned about at our last meeting and in, in the information part of the agenda, the chair will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Mrs. Holtz has made the motion, seconded by Mrs. Melnick. The voting board is open. The consent agenda has been approved. The chair will entertain a motion to approve the personnel report and administrative appointments. So moved. Mrs. Melnick has made the motion, seconded by Mrs. Rye. Is there discussion? The voting board is open. <coughs> Dr. Spence, would you like to introduce our new administrators? I certainly would. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. If I could just ask Susan Metzger to please stand up. You all should recognize Susan as a longtime teacher in Virginia Beach having taught at Ocean Lakes Elementary School, brief hiatus in Honolulu, Hawaii, and then back to Princess Anne Middle School before serving most recently as administrative assistant at Brandon Middle School. And I'm pleased that this evening you've accepted our recommendation for her to serve as assistant principal at Brandon Middle School. Congratulations. <laughs> I understand you have a guest with you. I do, I have my husband, Rob Metzger. Thank you, Mr. Metzger, for being here. If I could ask Jessica Roman to please stand up. You all should also recognize Jessica, who has been a longtime teacher here in Virginia Beach, having taught at Independence Middle School, as along with Tallwood High School. She has served as a math specialist at the Bayside sixth grade campus, a Title I resource teacher on that campus, and most recently as an administrative assistant at Bayside Middle School. And I'm pleased that this evening you've accepted our recommendation for her to serve as an assistant principal at the Bayside sixth grade campus. Congratulations. <laughs> I understand you've brought a few uh, guests. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> and finally, if I could ask Marcus Turner to please stand up. Marcus has worked in the division as a health and physical education teacher at Princess Anne Middle School and most recently has been serving as an administrative assistant these last two years at Larkspur Middle School. And again, I'm pleased that you've accepted our recommendation for Mr. Turner to serve as assistant principal at Larkspur Middle School. Congratulations. And you also have some guests with you who are taking lots of pictures. <laughs> We certainly appreciate your families being being here. We know that this is a team effort uh, between family and our administrators, and so we appreciate that very much. Madam Chairwoman, that, that's it. Thank you. The chair will entertain a motion to approve the fiscal year 2018-2019 budget rec reconciliation 
with the oh, goodbye local budget. <laughs> the motion is made by Mr. McDonald, seconded by Ms. Melnick. Ms. Is there discussion? Mr. Hansiker, coming forward. <laughs> I think we might have a few questions. Mr. Edwards, you have a question? I do. The, uh, the agenda does state reconciliation with the state budget, and I'm, my suggestion is that that be clarified in the, in the minutes. Okay. Good suggestion, because this is really not state reconciliation money yet. <laughs> That's correct. Okay, go ahead. I wanted to give you a brief update on the state right. um, before I uh, finish, uh, if I could. Go ahead. Um, the, as you know, the, the House uh, amended the original budget it, pre it presented by including some Medicaid funds. Um, they did a couple of other adjustments this past week, sent it to the Senate, and the Senate hasn't taken no action as of five o'clock today. Um, I talked to Joel Anderson, Richmond, and um, there's, there's, they're, they're where they were before. There's been no movement. They do think that the Senate will take it up probably sometime this week. What will be the outcome of that? Uh, nobody knows. Um, but this resolution just speaks to the additional five hundred fifty-eight thousand sixty-two dollars that we we're getting, and Dr. Spence explained to you the workshop. Uh, we'll use two pots of that money. Uh, two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars of it will be added to the ground services budget uh, to add an additional mowing cycle um, uh, with the city staff and the school staff, and and. $283,063 will be full time equivalent behavioral intervention specialist. So that's how we propose to use the money. We needed you to approve it tonight because that gets it ahead of when the city adopts its budget ordinance. So that will be done. If we don't get any resolution from the state before. They adopt a budget ordinance. I've been assured by the city staff that we could come back to the city council after they adopt an ordinance and they would amend whatever we bring back if the state budget changes. So okay. That's where we are. Well, we'll let the minutes reflect that the, this money, this additional money, is local money. Yes. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? This is Manning. I, I'm good. Oh, okay. So seeing no further discussion, the voting board is open. Okay, the motion has passed. The chair will entertain a motion for bylaw 1-5 legal counsel. The motion is made by Mrs. Briggs, seconded by Mrs. Holtz. Is there discussion? Mrs. Weems? I'd like to make a substitute motion. Um, I handed out to my colleagues the, uh, the school board bylaw 1-5 as was written and sent to us two weeks ago by our legal counsel. And I will, um, shall I explain that now or do you want to get a second now? Or do I need a second? Need a second. Okay. Second. Mrs. Manning has seconded. So I'll explain the um, the differences. Well, first of all, so so our um, Ms. Anderson gave us this today, and that's what that's what the the policy committee has um, has brought forward. Um, and then I gave you something that our legal counsel sent to us two weeks ago. By for clarification, Ms. Means for people on television, your what you were showing originally is what's in the agenda package. If they're looking online, is what you okay, said that right, was handed correct. out, and you're you're discussing something different that was would have proposed at the last meeting. Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, the similarities are both of them. Any member may request a written opinion. You have to do through legal counsel and all school board members. You may 
discuss it and close. The legal, the legal written opinion is then given to everybody. If not <clears throat> prohibited, we give it to the superintendent. And then a waiver of the attorney-client privilege, closed session, can only happen after majority vote. So both of them are the same on that. The difference is um, the, the policy committee brought forth um, what was in the agenda packet and what was given us today in red. On line um, three and four, it says the school board may discuss the request in closed session and may amend the request, period. What I would like to change it to, my substitute motion, is what Ms. Linetti sent to us two weeks ago, lines four, five, and six. The school board may discuss the request in closed session, the same, but this is added. And with the agreement of the school board member requesting it, it may be amend, they may amend the request. So if I'm coming forward with a request, I think that we should do everything as you know we said in both of these. But as we discuss it in closed session, I don't think it's right for six of you to say, Ms. Weems, we don't, we're not really interested in that information <laughs> because it may be something that I bring up that is fostered through something I'm interested in, through something I heard in the community. It may, you know, so. I don't think that six of y'all can then say we don't think that's valid because we're first of all don't not interested in it. Um, we we're, we're, haven't read upon it. We don't even you know know about it or whatever. Um, I think that we should discuss it together with legal counsel and then if we all want to amend it, we do. And I, you know I would agree agree upon it. Um, again, in the 16 years I've been on the school board, I can think of I think. I know two uh, written opinions, maybe three. I mean, there has not been hardly any. Um, so I think, you know, as city council does this, any of our delegation can ask, you know, Mark Herring for any kind of legal opinion. And I think that I represent the people and I should be able to ask for a legal opinion. And again, with the help of the colleagues in, in closed session, we can amend it. But um, the person asking for that legal opinion should have the right to, um, to continue it and should be able to actually get what they're requesting. So I hope that my colleagues will agree with that. And then I would like to, you know, reiterate this is what Ms. Linetti sent to us. So she felt, you know, pretty comfortable with us sending it to us two weeks ago. Is there any, is there any, any other discussion? Mr. McDonald. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, perhaps Mrs. Linetti or members of the policy committee would enlighten us as to how we got from what was sent a couple weeks ago to us to what is was proposed in our agenda packet. This proposal came as we were we were trying to make it smoother to read on there because we seem to be struggling at the last school board meeting to get the language we wanted. So we, we, it's actually, the language isn't that significantly different. It reads different, but the concepts were different. So I rewrote it for them, thought it was a little bit smoother, put the priority in the school board members may request a legal written opinion. We thought that needed to come first and then we just cleaned up the language a little bit. It actually isn't that significantly different as Ms. Weens has pointed out. The difference has to do with when you go into closed session and getting the approval of the school board member who made the request for the opinion. We just thought it was uh, thought it was a little bit smoother reading it this way. We thought it'd be easier to take out the first the paragraph um, that's struck out in, in the current um, version of one bylaw one five in the agenda and just start a whole new paragraph. Okay. What was the justification for removing with the agreement of school board member requesting legal opinion for changes to be made? That was discussed through the uh, members of the bit. That seemed to be a sticking point for us, and we thought this would be the best way to handle it. And I think other, the um, other members of the PRC would like to address that. I defer to the chair. Mrs. Rye. Yes, uh, Mrs. Linetti's original version went out before the policy committee had a chance to meet. And upon meeting, we weighed the input of the collective board, and the PRC ultimately felt that the uh, version uploaded to SharePoint reflected that that majority opinion. Mr. Edwards. The, the variation here is whether or not the school board attorney represents 11 individuals and should be at the beck and call of any, any one of the 11, or whether the school board attorney represents the the corporate body, the governance body of the collective will of the board. Um, 
The difference between the two versions puts uh, the substitute motion puts Mrs. Linetti in a position of, of responding to an individual board member. The proposed language from the policy review committee uh, puts the ultimate decision on what she will do uh, in the hands of the majority of the board. This is Manning. So part of our job as a school board member and as a board collectively is to make sure that policies and laws are followed. None of us have a law degree, so we depend on our legal counsel for that, both individually and collectively. We're elected individually, not collectively, and we are to the citizens of Virginia Beach individually and collectively. We need to have the ability to seek legal counsel as an individual and as a board, as a collective. And this is how city council does it. This is how our state legislators do it. Um, and I think that to tie our hands by requiring the school board, and I don't know if it's majority or, or how many, I guess six, six school board members could prevent an individual board member from seeking counsel that they believe is pertinent is just not right and and it's not the appropriate way that we represent the people of virginia beach and i support um, miss miss weems substitute motion mrs weems um yes and again this is something that, that is not done often and and mr edwards if we think back and, and look at what board members sitting here and what board members who have gone on to greener pastures or or um, the, the amount of time that some board members call, call our legal um, expert here and ask them tons and tons and tons and tons of questions, and she, you know, helps them. Um, I mean, that happens already. We've got some board members who suck up a lot of time from administrators and from our legal counsel. So, um, and we didn't do anything about that in the past. Um, so again, this is very rare. If, if it's something so important that I'm going to take the time and ask for a legal opinion, I should have that right to get that legal opinion. And again, it's, it's, I think that she represents me as a, I mean, she, I have to go to her as an individual because I was elected individually, like Ms. Manning said, and then we also go to her as a group. I think it's both. Um, and I don't think that this is going to be taken advantage, advantage of, and, and you can, you know, like I said, the past, we have not taken advantage. We have not asked for hardly any legal opinions. But if I want one, I should have the right to get one for <clears throat> the reasons that I lay out in front of my colleagues. And then we can discuss it in closed session and come up with the best best solution. You, I really don't think <clears throat> you, you need to stifle an individual's right to get a legal opinion. I don't think that's, <clears throat> that's right. Mr. McDonald. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Linetti and the policy committee members for kind of explaining their mindset in, in making the changes and uh, coming up with what was proposed. I think if nothing else in this debate, um, I have been pretty consistent with saying that if a board member has a legal question, whether it be something simple to be able to be discussed verbally with our legal counsel, whether it be something more complex that requires a written opinion that they should be able to get it. And for that reason, I'm supportive of Mrs. Weems' um, substitute motion. Mr. Edwards. <laughs> I, I did want to clarify, and actually Mr. McDonald partially alluded to it. The, uh, Every individual board member will retain the right to have an opinion presented to them verbally. The only question is whether or not we there is a formally documented opinion. So, and and opinions available and would remain available to any board member that opted to uh, solicit verbally the 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 opinion. The the. Issue is whether or not that an individual board member may require a fully documented and researched uh, opinion co committed formally in, into writing. And certainly, uh, Mrs. Williams is absolutely correct. It has not been done uh, with any regularity over the, the past two decades. 
the board is operating significantly differently in 2018 than it than in 2017 than it had heretofore, and my personal concern is that there is a potential for um, I won't use the word abuse because it's not, but it is uh, potentially uh, putting our legal resources. Uh, at the whim of an individual board member rather than, um, and they are limited. Uh, we've had to increase staff and we should be increasing staff based on the needs of the full board and not individual board members. Okay. <clears throat> Six. I, I, would, I would suggest if we're going to change policy on whims that that's not a good good way to practice. And if we, if we find in the next year that you know a, a one individual has asked for you know three or four or five written opinions, then we can come back and 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 visit again. But you don't you don't change bylaws or policy because of, of you might think something might happen on a whim. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the vote at this time is on the amendment. My suggestion is the you may want to Excuse read me. that amendment to make it clear what everybody's voting okay. on before they so, vote on it. So I'll read the the the, the, the substitute. Um, basically, it adds the words. It's the same as it was, but it adds the word. Should I read the whole thing? I think if I remember correct, there's one paragraph in the middle that you would be reading. It's one, yeah, it's not words. what school, I saw was not struck out. So right. Bit. The school board may consult with school board legal counsel at any time. School board members may request written legal opinions regarding matters related to the school board and the school division by providing school board legal counsel and all school board members with a written copy of such request. The school board may discuss the request in closed session and, and this is the part that's new, with the agreement of the school board member requesting the, regal, the written legal opinion, may amend the request. <clears throat> may amend the request was already already in, in the writing. So the only new language is with the agreement of the school board member requesting the le written legal opinion. The written legal option, opinion will be provided to all school board members and if not prohibited by the school board will be provided to the superintendent. Waiver of attorney client privilege for legal advice provided to the school board may only be done after a majority vote of the school board authorizes such waiver. <coughs> so we are yes, voting the at this time. The bylaw then remain the same. The bylaw there are, there are the paragraph but that all remains mm -hmm. the same. The rest of it remains the same as was published. So um, we are voting at this time um, on the uh, on the. It's not an amendment, but it's a substitute That's motion. Substitute motion. The voting board is open. <coughs> okay, so we're back to the main motion. The main motion. Could you read it as? The main motion, and this is as is currently published in the agenda. Correct. The first paragraph would say the same as is currently in the bylaw. This, the second paragraph would be um, the same, which is actually one line. It says the school board member may consult with school board legal counsel at any time. You would strike out the uh, next two sentences, and this will be the current paragraph that would be added. School board members may request written legal opinions regarding matters related to the school board and the school division by providing school board legal counsel and all school board members with a written copy of such request. The school board may discuss the request in closed session and may amend such request. The legal opinion will be provided to all school board members and if not prohibited by the school board will be provided to the superintendent. Waiver of attorney client privilege for legal advice provided to the school board may only be done after a majority vote of the school board authorizes such waiver. The paragraph that discusses the request for a written Conflict of interest for a personal school board member will remain the same as it currently is in the bylaw, and those would be the changes. So the page will just be the paragraph that I read. Okay. So is there any further discussion on this? Seeing none, the voting board is open. Now it's open. The motion has passed. 
We will not be doing bylaw 128 because of some changes we've identified that need to be made. And my understanding that will go to a new meeting and the PRC is going to hold this Thursday so that should come back for the next school board meeting. That's correct. The chair will entertain a motion to approve policy 4-18 for dismissal or placement on probation. The motion is made by Mrs. Holtz, seconded by Ms. Riggs. Is there discussion? Seeing no discussion. Planning board is open. The motion uh, to approve policy 4-18 has passed. The chair will entertain a motion to approve policy 5-29. <coughs> the motion is made by Mrs. Riggs, seconded by Mr. Ma Mr. Edwards. Is there discussion? Mrs. Manning. Um, so as I've said before, I'm not opposed to the idea of the Latin honor system. But under the proposed policy and based on last year's GPA numbers and 68% um, of all graduates at one of our high schools, which does not host an academy, will receive honors. At four more of our high schools, 63% of our students will receive honors. As Professor Ching mentioned earlier, district-wide, an average of 55% of all graduating seniors will receive honors. The word honor is defined as esteem at the highest level. How can we give an award to 68% of students and still call it an honor? These awards are being becoming watered down. When everyone gets an award, no one gets an award. There are students out there who compete to be at the top of their class. I've heard a few people state that the competition at the top is stressful. And that's the reason for abolishing valedictorian and salutatorian. As an athlete, I know firsthand that competition is stressful. However, I also know it's that stress that pushes a person to be the best that they can be. In a race, I'm more motivated to run faster and be my best if I have a competitor at my heels, not if I'm running the race alone. Adding wording that reads, the superintendent will create an avenue to recognize the student with the highest G GPA is not sufficient. That could mean the recognition could be a letter in the mail to the student. We need to celebrate the traditional achievement of valedictorian and <coughs> salutatorian and this educational excellence, not just have a cursory recognition. We need to be raising the bar for our students, not lowering it. These are the reasons I cannot support the proposed policy. Thank you, Mrs. Manning. <clears throat> Mr. Edwards. The, uh, to clarify one thing, we're, we are not changing the honor graduate standard. It has been 3.0 and under this proposed um, policy, it remains at 3.0. Um, the fact that a significant number of our students and an ever increasing number have is something to be proud of. Uh, we have we have increased the rigor. We have pushed our students harder. Our teachers are doing incredibly more than they ever did. Um, if we end up with 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 half the class like we have out there in gold rather than some other color, uh, whatever each school does to recognize, that's pretty neat, and and and, and I'm very happy with that. The the concern was expressed that advantage that you know that we give every advantage to the uh, to the graduating uh, students the whole reason we developed this dialogue with within within the board with with our principals and with the community was to deal with the propensity of di of unfair disadvantages that were created by the current system and the proposed system does that and it sustains and expands the recognition of, of excellence um, all the way up through the uh, Latin system and I'm very 
very happy with uh, where we are, and I'm very <clears throat> and I'm and I'm glad that the uh, the very top student will receive uh, recognition in a way that the principals uh, in working with the superintendent uh, develop and, and present in a regulation which we will see in advance. And I've got enough confidence in our principals that it will be an extremely appropriate uh, method that they will propose to the superintendent and he will approve his regulation. Mr. McDonald. Thank you. This has been an interesting discussion and debate, and we've gone a lot of different ways from our initial starting point, which was really concerns expressed by students at schools where there are academies or other programs where students in those programs are either required to or have access to rigorous coursework that lends them higher GPAs. And the concern expressed by students was, we don't have the ability to be recognized for our um, high academic achievement because we're not in those programs. We don't, we can't compete for valedictorian. We can't compete for salutatorian. And by the way, on our transcripts, even though we might have a 4.0 plus, our ranking is lower than it would be if those programs weren't in those schools. That was the initial concern given to us that sparked this whole conversation. And we have veered way from that, I think, talking about, you know, the competition for GPAs and talking about everyone gets a trophy and talking about not, you know, recognizing those that have the highest scores and, you know, somehow that is, is, um, is taking something away. I have generally, through this conversation, have been supportive of the Latin honor system because I think it recognizes more students for their high academic accomplishment based on what they have achieved and not what they have achieved in relation to the student that might be a hundredth or a thousandth of a point in their GPA way. And I think that was an important thing um, that was part of this conversation that sparked this whole thing. I'm generally supportive of that because I think we recognize more students, not fewer for their high academic accomplishments. I have a little bit of heartburn though with the latest change because we're again going back to saying we want to recognize those with the highest GPA and whether that's just a moment during graduation or a medal or whatever the case might be. This again is a fairness issue. We again are saying, well, we are going to um, recognize these students for having the highest GPA, but the students that aren't in those programs aren't gonna be able to compete for that. So that's gonna be a moment within their graduation ceremony where they're gonna say, oh, well, it's, you know, the IB students, that's that's their thing, or uh, whatever other academy program that has the, the high, high academic rigor with the weighted grades. I, I have concerns about that. Um, I would personally like to strike that fourth point in this policy in order for me to feel like this is actually accomplishing the original goal that we set out to accomplish, which is to ensure that our academic rec recognitions for graduations is fair between, for all students, um, not just only things that can be achieved by those in those academic programs. The, the point was fairness. Um, and, and I think we've just have gotten a bit away from that. Mrs. Weems. Thank you. Um, if we are gonna try to set up a fair playing field it's impossible. We can't do it. You can't do it in athletics because your best athletes, some of them have resources at home where they play on different teams. Some of them have parents who can coach them. Um, music we had, some people have unfair advantages because their parents are musicians, they have instruments, they have private lessons, academics, some of them get tutors, some of them, um, we just can't put, it, it, I just don't think it can happen, and I think that we're we're just amusing ourselves to think that we can make everything a fair playing field. It's not gonna. It doesn't happen in the real world. It doesn't happen in business. It doesn't happen at home in your home life, um, because there's just too many variables. 
Um, I still think that with academics that it, it is noteworthy to have someone to strive to and, and be the top GPA, whether it's one one thousandth again, that you know, that's hard to take, you know, losing the top GPA for one one thousandth of a point, but it's life. There, there's sometimes a person that gets the very top and with education I think it's very important to um, to acknowledge the, the, the valedictorian and salutatorian. Also, I said last week, there's scholarship money um, awarded in some cases to people, uh, graduates who are named valedictorian and salutatorian. Um, I looked at one place where a parent said that their son got 8,000 extra dollars for being named that. Um, most of them were 1,500, a couple thousand, you know, late scholarships, and, and they said it wasn't enough, which I agree. But, um, you know, and I don't want to play with somebody's finances either. So, so you know, I, I'm fine with the Latin system. I wish that we would have gotten a little bit more meatier um, um, bylaws or regulations saying that this is how we're going to um, do the valedictorian and salutatorian, but but I didn't. We didn't get that. Um, it's just a little bit too iffy. Um, but I think that um, yeah, this has has been a very interesting interesting um, conversation and journey. And I and I talked to tons of people, and I have not found many at all. I mean, a handful on one hand who thinks getting rid of rid of valedictorian and salutatorian. Um, is a good thing. And remember, we did ask, I know one of our speakers said, did we ask parents and did we ask teachers, did we ask students? We did. 70% of the students don't take away valedictorian and salutatorian, almost 75% of parents. So we did ask and we did get feedback. Mr. Edwards. For the record, I'm in total agreement with Mr. McDonald. Um, the, the reason I'm supporting the current version <laughs> is the fact that in a governance process like this, if both sides of an issue are a little uncomfortable, not totally satisfied, that's probably an acceptable outcome. Um, I, I was not pleased and had extensive conversations with the, with the superintendent. And he convinced, he, he, I won't say convinced, but he certainly explained uh, why he inserted the, uh, the, the the language that he did, and I can live with that. But but I, I assure you, Mr. McDonald, if you had proposed an amendment to strike that out, I would have seconded it. But um, I'm not sure that's where we are. Mr. McDonald, I move that we amend to strike the fourth point in the policy. <laughs> Second. Second. <laughs> Mr. McDonald, for clarification, would that be under policy 529? Are you talking about E, class rank number four, to determine the valedictorians and salutatorians for the graduating class? F4. Oh, F4. 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 So could As we read? points being held, that's what's being could, could we read what it is exactly that you, were, you would like to strike out? Under subsection F, honor designations, paragraph four, the superintendent shall develop regulations for formally acknowledging academic achievement for graduating seniors to include the students with the highest GPA. You're proposing in your substituted mo motion to remove that section. Correct. Okay, Mrs. Rye. Uh, well, speaking to that, Mr. Speaking to that point specifically, uh, I agreed. I had gone on record previously that rankless means rankless. Uh, in the meantime, I, I can understand Mr. Uh, you know, Mr. Edwards, and I was there at one point too, understanding that this uh, this policy is important enough, and there were enough stakeholders involved that I could I could live with with that possibly. I, I do want to, um, and I guess I guess I have to limit my comments right now to just this one particular point, right? So I'll save my others for later. Mr. McDonald. I lost my train of thought. I'll come back. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but it was to say to be, for me to be consistent, I would vote to go rankless all the way. 
um, I was I was um, happy with the fact that this was added in and felt that it was a good compromise. Um, so, um, you know, I personally could live with it either way, but I'm, I, I feel more confident that at least the highest GPA person would, would be at least recognized um, with, with that left in. Um, so I'm not really in favor of striking it. I feel like that, that person needs to be recognized somehow, but um, anyway, that's just my opinion on it. Ms. Williams? I just want to remind our colleagues that we have gotten feedback on this and, and the community, community and students overwhelmingly that gave us feedback do not want this. Referring to the valedictorian, the salutatorian, not the, not the Latin. So Mrs. Manning, remember to, um, this is talking about striking that one section. I think Ms. Melnick was before me, if she'd like. Oh, it does. I was just gonna say for the record, the people we um, surveyed most of the people that responded are not a, are not a part of this. They don't have a dog in this fight. We did not survey middle school students and parents. We we surveyed high school as well, and it doesn't go into effect right away. It's with the graduating class of twenty of twenty twenty two, correct? Correct. correct. So yeah, I, we I surveyed did. the wrong people. I disagree. Okay. Mrs. Manning, um, I believe, didn't we survey middle school students? Yes, we did. Okay. Um, so, you know, I respect my colleagues. You have a different viewpoint than me. I'm trying to understand it and I just don't. <laughs> we recognize teacher of the year, superintendent of the year, athlete of the year, um, you know, we have all these designations, but we can't recognize the top two students at every school for academic excellence. No, I, I, I just I can't don't. wrap my head around that. So I'll, I'll, yeah. I've said my piece. <laughs> this is Mel, I think we have some confusion because I think most of us came into, into this discussion with the amendment that Dr. Spence made two weeks ago. So I thought in talking to a lot of people that we were in favor of leaving it as recognizing the top the top students as a compromise as, as um, Mrs. Anderson stated per Dr. Spence's amendment two weeks ago. Um, I'd also like to say that the one school, so it's either Cox or Kellum that has 68% of students graduating with honors, I think it's remarkable and I think it's wonderful and I hate the term participation trophy. So just to be clear, mathematically, 32% of those students will not get that extra pat on the back at either Kellum or Cox. But we should be, we really should be in favor of recognizing these students with a 3.0 and above. We haven't changed that, we haven't lowered that. and. To send that message to students, I think, is wrong. Thank you. Right. I, I, I just want to point out, too, that um, <laughs> um, we have all of our high school principals here in the audience this evening who have come here to show support for this. Um, and um, I, just want to, I just want to say that, you know, they are in favor of the policy as is written. And they're here to show support for that. So um, I am against the amendment to change or to strike the wording of acknowledging, uh, allowing the superintendent to, to send um, a directive out so that principals can at least acknowledge the highest GPA. Mr. Edwards. I just wanted the superintendent to clarify the the. the uh, document we looked at last week had the full support of 11 principals and it did not provide for that. Have the principals been surveyed and, and actually said that they absolutely want to do this? So the conversation with, with Mr. Kiever representing the principals and, and then some dialogue that I've had with individuals, individual principals was they would appreciate the opportunity to work with this incoming students and determine how they would recognize those graduates. 
and but it's, but the wording actually requires that the uh, that it that it be that that one person be formally recognized, and they are would they like to have the flexibility of deciding that yes or no, or they want to be forced into it? You know, Mr. Edwards, it's it's a, a fair question, but I also think it's a question that's indicative of some of the challenges that we have with a policy like this, which is I think at some point our principals just like some direction. I agree. And I think if we give them some direction that our principals will do what it is that we ask them to do. And as you all have talked about from the dais on a couple of occasions, there is no perfect answer to the challenge that we're facing. You all, I mean, you could see the community doesn't have perfect agreement, the board doesn't have perfect agreement, and I think at some point our principals want to know where to go. And uh, so I think that's just the, you know, frankly, the challenge. I mean, I think we could go back and poll them again and we could find out if they particularly like that regulatory language. But I think if we, if we recognize that they have the opportunity to work with the incoming class and identify the means by which they would recognize their graduates, I think every principal in the back of the room would not affirmatively, we can get that done. I feel really confident. Mr. McDonald. I just want to remind my colleagues that there was another option initially discussed to fix the fairness issue, which was to, in schools where there are special programs, academies, et cetera, was to actually split up the class rank and acknowledge students on each side of the school. And the immediate feedback to us was principals didn't want to divide their schools that way. If we keep this point in this policy, I'm going to be pushing to make sure that that gets divided between those students because I still think it doesn't solve the issue of fairness. All right, seeing no further comments. Just we for are clarification, I'm gonna make. Right, we need to clarify <laughs> what we're voting on right now. Legal counsel, appreciate that. Policy 529 as the substitute motion is, as presented in the agenda, you would remove section F4, which says the superintendent shall develop regulations for formally acknowledging academic achievement for graduating seniors to include the students with the highest GPA. That would be removed and the rest of the policy would be approved as drafted and in the agenda. Okay. That is the substitute motion. All right. No, it's right. An to, it's an amendment Not to. It's an amendment to the motion. Like that. Right. To well, you can do it either way. That's yeah. what we're trying to clarify. The clerk. To, to go yes. rankless. To go rankless, you yes, vote you green. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Because what will happen if you're just amending that? Then you're going to have to vote in the main motion. So. Right. So right so are now. Are we clear what we're voting on? Joel's the amendment to remove the wording that allows the superintendent to directs, directs the superintendent to to what <laughs> i don't have it in directs front of me right to develop a regulation um, asking the, the acknowledgement of the highest gpa now. the highest gpa and yes. all you're doing at this time would be removing that section then you could okay. go back to the main motion after okay. vote on it are we ready to vote <laughs> green's good Voting board is open. Okay. So that at this point, you are now back to the policy as presented in the agenda. Correct. To use that section with that. With that part of the of the of the uh, policy still attached remains. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Okay. Voting board is open. Okay, the motion has passed. The chair will entertain a motion to approve policy 6-72, student evaluation and grading, class rank. So. Motion is made by Ms. Melnick, seconded by Mrs. Rye. Is there discussion? <coughs> Can, 
Ms. Lynette, can you refresh me on this one, please? This one is student, this is the last one you did had to do in section five, which is overall students. So this one has to do with section six, which is curriculum instruction. Instruction Matters, Policy 672, the title is Student Evaluation and Grading. You would remove the term class rank on there. You would have Section A, which would be Evaluation and Grading. That would not change as it's currently written in the policy. What you do have in your policy under class rank has to do with the grade point average and how you determine class rank and use it. That would be removed. Section C, which had to do with, um, would now be B, class rank and all it's going to um, allow you to have is appeals of student grades, which is what is the final paragraph in that paragraph, in that, that policy. You're not going to recognize valedictorians, salutatorians. You will not be doing, it doesn't discuss honor grads. It doesn't discuss the um, students for diff different diplomas. Part of that is because those things appear in other places and policies, but it does take, refer to the, the valedictorian, salutatorian <coughs> sections. So what, what you were seeing before, which you, which you were discussing the prior policy, the class ranking, the honor grads, that is now appearing in 529. It is being pulled out of this particular um, policy. This particular policy is just gonna talk about evaluation, grading, and appealing grades. So all everything having to do with recognizing somebody as, as to how they did academically when they graduate now appears in policy 29. So this really isn't doing anything different. Right. You're just not gonna have two competing You're policies. somewhere else, okay, thank you. Okay, is there further discussion? Okay, seeing none, voting board is open. <coughs> okay, the motion has passed. So 672 is approved. The chair will entertain a motion to approve policy 6-81, adult education. Motion is made by Ms. Felton, seconded by Mrs. Rye. Is there discussion? This particular policy only had scrivener's changes. There was nothing significant in that, in the policy amendment. Seeing no discussion, the voting board is open. Motion is passed. The chair will entertain a motion to approve policies 7-15, distribution announcements of outside communication. Motion is made by Mrs. Manning, seconded by Mrs. Holtz. Is there discussion? Seeing no discussion, the voting board is open. The motion is passed. Thank you. For information this evening, we have the interim financial statement. Mr. Hansiker. <clears throat> oh, Chairwoman Anderson, Vice Chairman McDonald, members of the school board, superintendent. Um, last time I was up here, we we're talking about the resolution. Put it your place on the dais, city manager requested that we provide the school board with an executive summary of really the, the operating budget proposed by the, the city manager. And so we have a copy. It's, it's a gr good executive summary of, of what uh, is included in a document. It's about 300 pages. Um, as of March 31st, the overall revenue trend remains acceptable at this point in the fiscal year, as illustrated by the first graph here. Uh, our previously reported projected shortfall in the state revenue uh, based on the governor's proposed amendments introduced in the Caboose bill was approximately $345,000. Uh, that's been adjusted unofficially because of our March 31st ADM it's looking to come in slightly higher than expected and the shortfall will be reduced to just $68,000. Federal re revenue continues to remain acceptable. We received a second uh, impact aid payment in March of approximately $2.5 million. 
Uh, the sales tax receipts also continue to remain an acceptable trend as illustrated in the next graph here. Year to date through March, we're approximately $640,000 higher than last year at this time. For April, we're seeing a small decrease of approximately $22,000 compared to April of this past year. The final graph shows the expenditure encumbrance trend continues to remain acceptable at this point in the physical year. And this concludes my presentation. I have to answer any questions you might have. Do you have any questions or comments? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Hansen. Thank you. Are there any standing committee reports? Ms. Riggs? I just want to report on the sister cities um, I, and thank all of the school board members um, that were able to attend the breakfast that we did last Thursday and with uh, many of the um, city employee or city leaders and uh, it was very successful. Um, so thank you very much for supporting that and we will continue to support cities, sister cities with the school board and the whole city. So it was very successful. I think everybody enjoyed it. Um, the kids did really, really well uh, representing us and our youth ambassador. Um, you have to admit, if you were there, has a gorgeous voice and she's only um, 15, 16 years old, 10th grader. So it was excellent. Thank you for supporting it. Excellent. Thank you. Mrs. Melnick. So last week, uh, well, first of all, a few months ago, Dr. Robertson told you about a grant we received um, from the Carnegie Foundation in conjunction with Two Revolutions, and we met for the second time last week. Um, I really want to share this information with you because I think it's so important, but we began to tackle um, our discussion about our assets, our barriers, and our perceptions. We reviewed preliminary outtakes from a landscape analysis. Um, and I think this is the most important thing I, I want to share with you. Um, at that meeting last week, they had, conduct, they had conducted 34 phone interviews, um, 11 principals, 10 from local government, two business leaders, two from higher education, two current high school students, three teachers, one at each level, and um, four people from local and regional nonprofits. Um, and every single person, all 34, mentioned Dr. Spence and our division leadership. And the number two comment was about our strategic plan, Compass to 2020. Um, the work this division is doing is amazing and people are recognizing that. So what can you do? So there are opportunities for you all to get involved. We're having... Um, a few community-based visioning sessions um, on Monday, April 30th from 4 until 5.30 in the Scola at Landstown. Um, they will be there. They will also be at the Kellum Scola the same date, April 30th from 6.30 to 8. And then on Wednesday, May 30th, um, they'll be at the Green Run Library, library from 4 to 5.30 and the Salem High School Scola from 6.30 to 8. And we would love to have you participate. You can spread the word to your neighbors and friends. Um, the more, the better. Um, but we also need you to RSVP. So um, it's a simple, simple email. It's Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y at tworevolutions.net, and it's the number two, tworevolutions.net. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Yes. Rye. Yeah, I just want to reiterate what Ms. Lanetti mentioned earlier that there will, uh, it would be, there is a policy committee meeting Thursday at three o'clock. We're adding a second meeting this month just to accelerate a few things. Thank you. Any other, Mrs. No. Malnick? No, no. no. Okay. All right. Well, that concludes our formal meeting. Madam Clerk, do we have any speakers on non?